Off the Ball. In association with AIR. Don't miss live Allianz League's GAA action this month on the AIR Sport Pack, the home of Irish sport. This is News Talk. And you're very welcome along to this evening's show. It's Joe here. So on the show tonight, we will have former Manchester United legend Brian Robson in studio on the football show, reflecting on his fairly phenomenal career with Manchester United and England. Keith Andrews also on the football show this evening. We will have Kevin Cullen of the Boston Globe in part two of his Boston sports legend slot as well after eight o'clock. Text number is 53106. We are on Twitter at Off The Ball. Uh, but in news terms, as you might have suspected, instead of our usual news round, we will spend the next while or so reflecting on the conclusion of the Belfast rape trial. Those of you of a sensitive disposition or with children near the radio, maybe turn off now and rejoin us just after eight o'clock. We'll recap on the trial in just a few moments with Frank Graney, our News Talk Courts correspondent. And then uh, hopefully have a uh, worthwhile, honest chat about some of the issues this high profile case has thrown up, uh, namely consent, which is maybe something we should all be talking about a whole heap more in Irish life generally. So we'll aim to do that, have an honest, forthright conversation about where we are as a country and where we should be going. So that is the plan. And if you have absolutely no interest in that and uh, before you text in report on sport, uh, join us at eight o'clock and that's the plan for this evening. So we're going to kick that off now. And again, sensitive disposition or children near the radio now would be the time. So as I'm sure you've heard and as you would have heard in our news bulletin there, the four men accused in the Belfast rape trial, Paddy Jackson, Stuart Olding, Blaine McElroy and Rory Harrison, were acquitted of all charges at Belfast Crown Court this afternoon. Jackson and Olding have been found not guilty of raping the then 19-year-old in June 2016. Blaine McElroy was acquitted on the charge of exposure and Rory Harrison was acquitted of charges of perverting the course of public justice and withholding information. Paddy Jackson uh, spoke outside court this afternoon. Yeah, I'd just like to thank uh, the judge and the jury for giving me a fair trial. Uh, my parents for being here every day, uh, as well as my brother and sisters. Um, I'd like to thank uh, my barristers, Brendan Kelly and Stephen Cole, and my solicitors, Joe McVeigh and Kevin Winters of KRW Law. Uh, out of respect for my employers, I have nothing further to comment. Um, so that was all Jackson said. His solicitor, who he mentioned, Joe McVeigh, then spoke. We have this to say on behalf of our client, Patrick Jackson. We're grateful to the jury for reaching what was a common sense verdict of not guilty on all counts. Paddy has been consistent in his denials and in his account. Consistency had never been a feature of the complainant's evidence long before she entered the witness box. So these acquittals should come as no surprise to anyone. Paddy leaves court for the last time today as he entered it almost 10 weeks ago, an innocent man. The prosecution made much of a perceived privileged position provided by virtue of Paddy being an international rugby player. We say that it was this very status as a famous sportsman that drove the decision to prosecute in the first place. Much has been said in the course of this trial by way of criticism of the police investigation. We've little to add to what's already been said, but it's our belief that the investigation has been characterized by the turning of a blind eye to inadequacies in the evidence of the complainant combined with very apparent investigative bias. Paddy and his parents have paid a heavy price personally professionally and financially. This price was paid despite the fact that he has never been anything other than entirely innocent. On the face of it, this robust assertion of its independence by the jury embodied in these acquittals for all four men may suggest that the trial process is in good health. That is not the case. Vile commentary expressed on social media going well beyond fair comment has polluted the sphere of public discourse and raised real concerns about the integrity of the trial process. To that end, we want to thank the learned trial judge Patricia Smith 
for her management of this trial in the face of an onslaught of toxic content, particularly on Twitter. Several days of this trial were lost due to problems thrown up by the intrusive infection of the process by social media. All the lawyers have been distracted by having to man the barriers against a flood of misinformed, misconceived and malicious content on the internet, particularly during the last phase of this trial. And worryingly, even at the hands of public servants who should have known better. There's no reason to believe that this problem will not worsen. To that, to that end, we invite the Office of the Lord Chief Justice, the Attorney General and the Public Prosecution Service to enter into fresh discussions with us to look at more robust mechanisms that can strike an effective balance between everyone's rights, but that properly secure the integrity of our criminal justice system. As for Paddy, his main priority now is to return to work. That means getting back on the rugby pitch and representing his province and his country. Thank you. So that's Joe McVeigh, Paddy's Jackson's uh, solicitor. And on that point, within an hour of the verdict, the IRFU and Ulster Rugby released a joint statement which reads, The IRFU and Ulster Rugby note the verdict handed down today at the Belfast Crown Court in relation to the cases or the case brought against Paddy Jackson and Stuart Olding. We wish to acknowledge that this has undoubtedly been a difficult and extremely traumatic time for all involved. To respect the judicial proceedings, the IRFU and Ulster Rugby postponed any internal review of the matter with the players until the proceedings concluded. IRFU and Ulster Rugby officials will review the matter in line with existing procedures for all contracted players. A review committee made up of senior representatives of the IRFU and Ulster Rugby has been appointed and will conclude its review as soon as practicable. Uh, practical rather. The players will continue to be relieved of all duties while the review committee is in process and determining its findings. So that was the statement from the RFU and Ulster Rugby this afternoon. Uh, we did just clarify with the RFU if the uh, tenancies of either Rory Best or Ian Henderson would be assessed as part of the proposed internal review and the answer was no in both instances. So a final point then from outside the court this afternoon was Stuart Olding's solicitor who spoke as well and here he is, Paul Dugan. I want to start by thanking the judge and the jury for their time and patience throughout this long trial. I am very relieved that the jury has accepted my explanation as to what occurred. I want to acknowledge publicly that though I committed no criminal offence on the evening of the 28th of June 2016, I regret deeply the events of that evening. I want to acknowledge that the complainant came to court and gave evidence about her perception of those events. I am sorry for the hurt that was caused to the complainant. It was never my intention to cause any upset to anyone on that night. I don't agree with her perception of events and I maintain that everything that happened that evening was consensual. I have consistently told the truth to the police and the court when asked to account for my conduct. The Stuart Olding who has been portrayed over the past nine weeks in this trial is not the real Stuart Olding. I am fiercely proud to represent my province and my country. I have worked very hard to achieve those goals. I hope to be able to prove myself going forward in all aspects of my life. I would like to thank my legal team for their hard work and their belief in me throughout. And finally, to my family, thank you all for standing by me from the beginning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Frank Rainey, News Talks Courts correspondent, joins us. So all four acquitted Frank. An initial point to make about this afternoon is just how quickly deliberations concluded. Yeah, especially con considering the duration of the trial. I mean, it was initially set down for five weeks and it almost doubled that. This was week nine. Um, five weeks of evidence before the prosecution closed its case. A week then of evidence on behalf of the various defence teams. The jurors heard from each of the four defendants. Over 30 witnesses were called. Witness statements, 
um, were, were given to the jurors, um, CCTV footage, medical and forensic evidence, and despite all that, they returned after just three hours and 45 minutes. It is, in my mind, um, exceptionally quick for a jury uh, to come back. But again, given the nature of these things and, and the fact that we'll never know um, what happened um, uh, in the jury room, um, we won't we won't know for sure but three hours and 45 minutes I mean I was outside at the time I was filing for for the afternoon news bulletins just to say that the jury was still deliberating when I noticed a bit of hive of activity from inside the courthouse mm -hmm. and when I came in the four defendants who had been in the canteen with family and friends having cups of tea and coffee and having bites to eat um, I noticed that there was a scramble to get up to the fourth floor so um, it was clear that something uh, significant was happening. Um, Paddy Jackson, interestingly, was just ahead of me in the stairs as we went upstairs. It was a queue for the elevator, so we decided to take the stairs, and Paddy Jackson was upstairs. And uh, his mother, uh, just before he went into the double doors separating him from the public gallery and the dock where he was to take his seat a few minutes, a few minutes later, his mother uh, patted him on the back almost reassuringly and comforted him uh, before he went in to learn his fate. He did a few moments later, and he was the first of the four to learn his fate, uh, the jury obviously coming back and acquitting him of both charges. Uh, Judge Smith warned members of the public in advance not to react when the verdicts were read out. What was the atmosphere in court at the time? Quite surreal, I suppose, is, is the best answer. Um, uh, in my experience, that warning isn't unusual, particularly for high-profile cases. There are 100 seats in the public gallery. A quarter of those were allocated for the overflow of, of journalists um, covering the case, and that's where I was seated. So there are 75 seats, 75 seats that have been pretty much filled throughout the past nine weeks. They were certainly all uh, full today, um, and there was very little reaction uh, when the verdicts came in. Now, the public gallery is uh, directly behind the dock, so we could only actually see the back of the four defendants' heads. They were asked to stand while the verdicts were read out, and there was very little reaction from them at that point. As some of their family and friends, I noticed, uh, were shedding tears and were embracing each other. But the real sense, uh, sense of relief, I suppose, uh, for the defendants and celebration took place outside the courtroom. So mm. when I left, um, Rory Harrison and his family were directly outside those double doors leading into uh, courtroom 12 on the fourth floor and he was being embraced by his family. Uh, Paddy Jackson, I noticed, just steps that stepped out of a consultancy room with his barrister and I noticed him shaking his hand, Mr Brendan Kelly, who has represented him throughout before again. He was surrounded and comforted by his family. Uh, Blaine McElroy was the first to leave the courthouse. He didn't stop to address uh, the media. He left with his legal team and his family. His mother and his sister had been at at the trial uh, throughout. Paddy Jackson was next out and you played some clips there, a short statement uh, from him and uh, a much longer statement uh, from his uh, solicitor, Joe McVeigh. Uh, Rory Harrison was next out. Uh, Rory Harrison obviously acquitted today of, of perverting the course of justice and withholding um, information from the police. The allegation against him was that he essentially uh, covered up what was alleged to have happened. Now, Rory Harrison left through the front gate. There are two gates leading into Laganside Court. Uh, the gathered media were at the side gate. Rory Harrison left through the front gate. So as I'm sure you can imagine, there was a scramble to get across him. People wanted to get photographs. People wanted to get video footage. People wanted to see if he wanted to say anything in light of the acquittals. He didn't, but he was very unlucky because as he tried to cross a busy street outside Laganside Courts, he was at the traffic lights and that little green uh, man turned red just as the press um, got on top of him. So he, st he stood there patiently, eyes focused on that little red man uh, before he crossed uh, the road and, and made his way out of the area. Stuart Olding was the last to come out then. He came out but maybe an hour later mm -hmm. with his lawyer. Uh, he didn't make a statement himself, but he was standing uh, beside his uh, solicitor uh, when he read out that statement that you've just played, Joe. And Frank, where would the complainant have watched proceedings today? We haven't seen the complainant since she stepped down from the witness box. She was the first witness called. It took her an hour and a half to go through her evidence in chief. And then she spent uh, seven days uh, being cross-examined and, and re-examined by the prosecuting barrister before she stepped down. Now, we haven't seen her in the courtroom uh, since, but there was arrangements made uh, so that she could um, certainly listen to proceedings. There was an audio feed um, into a witness room in the belly of the court, and she was, she was um, uh, permitted to be there throughout and I know that before the jury was called back today, uh, that audio link was established with this room. Now, we don't know for sure if she was there, mm -hmm. but I'd say you can take it for granted uh, that she was. We yeah. do know at this point uh, that she is aware of the verdicts. 
um, a police officer has spoken to her, described her as being upset and disappointed with the results, but she said that she doesn't regret coming forward with her complaint despite everything. This has been an incredibly long process. So uh, let's just try and recap on some of the key points. It was noticeable that Judge Smith uh, spoke at length to the jury in the last number of days before their deliberations, effectively recapping some of the evidence and, and, and directing the jury at certain instances. So uh, let's take a number of points. Uh, like what was very striking was that Judge Smith made the point that there were inconsistencies in the complainant's claims and in the defendant's claims and to take those into account. And this has been a case where there seem to have been inconsistencies across the board. They've been a big part of this trial. They certainly have, yeah, and it's no surprise, my experience covering the, these cases, when it's generally a case of one person's word against another, or in this case, one person's word against several others, um, there are inconsistencies and differing accounts, and uh, the judge did direct the, um, the, the jurors at great length, I might add, in relation to inconsistencies and how they should treat them. Um, for example, the inconsistencies in the initial accounts uh, that the complainant gave to her friends and to uh, doctors when she was forensically examined afterwards uh, differed somewhat from the accounts that she gave to uh, police during her recorded statements and indeed the evidence she gave uh, to the men and women of the jury when she was called by the prosecuting barrister Toby Hedworth. Now those inconsistencies for example as uh, she first told the uh, her friends uh, that she had been raped by three men and that was something that um, she told the, uh, the, the doctor that she'd been raped uh, by, t by two men. There was no mention of oral sex. The allegation against Stuart Holding was that he forced her to perform oral sex on him. So these were inconsistencies um, between her initial accounts and her final version of events. Uh, but the judge did tell the uh, jury that it was the prosecution's case, that the reason for the inconsistencies was the trauma in the immediate aftermath, uh, particularly in the, um, the Rowan sexual assault referral clinic where she was forensically examined by Dr. Uh, Philip Lavery and she gave an account of uh, him which was proven to be inconsistent, the defence alleged. The prosecution claimed that was because of trauma. The defence claimed it wasn't. The defence claimed it was because she was lying, that she had made this whole thing up because she was worried that she had been recorded engaging in what they claimed was a consensual threesome with Paddy Jackson and Stuart Olding, and that she feared that um, if it got out, if it was leaked on social media, uh, that her life would be ruined and that she could cop to this whole thing. And by the time she made a complaint, things got out of hand and she couldn't row back on what she said. Mm. That was essentially uh, the defence's case. Now, in relation to differences in the accounts, and there were many uh, between the four defendants, for example, uh, Paddy Jackson and Rory Harrison both told the jurors uh, that the woman was staring at and seemed to be fixated with Paddy Jackson back at the party. Blaine McElroy said that she was trying it on with everybody and that at one point while they were dancing, she even tried to kiss him. So there were many differences between their accounts that they gave from uh, the witness box. And again, um, Judge Smith told the jurors that it was up to them to decide whether they were lying. And she also warned them that people lie for all sorts of reasons and that there could be innocent reasons. And they had to take that into account in their deliberations as well. Mm. The, um, the WhatsApp message situation uh, featured very prominently on uh, front pages and there was uh, an element of uh, bravado to be very kind about the, um, the nature of those messages, which uh, people I think found incredibly distasteful. Uh, Judge Smith again referenced those in her, delibera in her uh, uh, final instruction to the jury before deliberations and said, well, they don't necessarily uh, point to uh, guilt. So that was a huge element of this trial. And also uh, deleted messages. And there were, I mean, one phone in particular was wiped completely. Uh, yes, that's right. That's the phone belonging to um, Rory Harrison. Now, the prosecution uh, claimed that he uh, deliberately deleted those text messages. And those text messages would have been exchanges that he had uh, with the complainant after dropping her home in a taxi mm. in the early hours of June 28, 2016. We heard that they had exchanged numbers earlier in the night. Neither of them were 100% sure when that happened. Uh, but subsequent inquiries revealed that that actually happened outside Ollie's nightclub uh, before they went back to the house party at Paddy Jackson's house and we heard that after he walked her and helped her up to her front door and got back into the taxi and that he had texted her to say chin up you wonderful woman and that he had sent her a link to a song to comfort her uh, when he got home and that he texted her again the next day to ask how she was and that she sent him a text message just before he met his friends at Soul Food Cafe on the Ormo Road in Belfast which isn't uh, too far from where Paddy Jackson uh, lives uh, down near uh, Ravenhill Road 
Um, we heard the Chia sent him a text message to say that what happened last night was not consensual. That text, was, that text message was also deleted. And interestingly, and none of these text messages were disclosed when Rory Harrison gave a witness statement to police after she had made a complaint. He wasn't being treated as a suspect at the time. And that was the basis of one of the counts uh, that he faced and denied and was obviously um, acquitted of today. Now, Rory Harrison said that the issue with his phone in August of 2016, some months after the allegation um, was made, uh, he said that his phone just wiped. It was an Apple phone and it just died. Um, everything was wiped. It wasn't his fault. He tried to get it fixed. He brought it to a shop in Dublin. He couldn't get it fixed. Mm. So that was his excuse for it. Again, it was up to the jury to decide yeah. whether uh, they believed him. Uh, this case was also uh, potentially unusual, uh, and you cover these uh, obviously far more than um, than I do. But in that there was an independent witness uh, in this case uh, who seemed to be used by both the prosecution and the defence. Well, she was certainly called as a prosecution witness, but I do feel, and I felt at the time, at listening to her evidence, that she served the defence's case probably more so than she did the prosecution's case. This is a woman by the name of Dara Florence. Uh, she was one of the four women, which included the complainant that were back at the party. She didn't know the complainant beforehand, as uh, she didn't know the defendants beforehand. Um, she'd been invited back to this party by Blaine McElroy, apparently. As uh, she described the complainant as nice, pleasant, she said that they had general chit-chat, they danced a little, as uh, she didn't think that she was overly drunk. Mm -hmm. And she gave evidence of going upstairs at one point uh, because she had lost one of her friends and her and her other friend had decided to leave the party and they were going looking for this third friend. Now, she said that when she was going up the stairs of Paddy Jackson's small townhouse, um, narrow stairs leading up to uh, the upstairs bedrooms, um, she said that she heard uh, some noises. She couldn't quite describe what they were. She did describe them as moaning, but she said they weren't distressed. She didn't think they were sexual. She said she wouldn't have gone into the room if she did think that they were. When she went in and she spent less than a minute in there, she said that she saw Paddy Jackson uh, behind the woman on the bed and uh, that he was having sex with her. She said she was 100% sure that he was having sex with her. And I suppose that's where she fed into the prosecution's case because Paddy Jackson ma maintained throughout that there was no sexual intercourse uh, between them, that she had performed oral sex on him, but that she had done so willingly and consensually. So she said that she had felt that she had just witnessed a threesome, that Stuart Olding was on his back and that the woman's head was down towards his middle area and that she didn't think that the woman was in any way distressed and that she didn't think that she had just witnessed a rape. So she was called as a prosecution witness, but I think her evidence probably served the defence's case um, more so than the prosecution. Yeah. So um, feel free to editorialise as much or as little as you want um, at this point. It was quite striking, and it was front page news every day that the... Um, the uh, woman at the centre of this case was on the stand for uh, seven days, close to eight days at one point, and uh, was cross-examined by the four solicitors of the uh, four defendants, which uh, must be a serious ordeal. Uh, your impressions, uh, Frank, of those eight days and her performance? Yeah, well, certainly I, I wouldn't have been in a position to describe how, how I thought her demeanour was because one person's perception, this was actually a feature of the case uh, uh, in relation to perceptions and inconsistencies and things like that. One person's perception of something, particularly when alcohol has been taken, may ent differ entirely from another's. So my perception wouldn't have been very helpful because the only ones that mattered during the trial were the 11 mm. uh, jurors watching her during this process. But I thought that Given the, given the evidence and, uh, and how difficult and traumatic it must have been for her to give it, I thought she was very composed throughout. Um, I, I, thought she was, I thought she was very strong in the witness box. She became visibly upset at times, particularly when she was giving a blow-by-blow -blow account of what she alleged happened during that second visit to Paddy Jackson's bedroom when she, was claim, when she claims uh, that she was raped by him before Stuart Olding walked in. And she said that she remembered pleading with Paddy Jackson, but that despite her pleas, uh, Stuart Olding uh, joined in and forced her to perform oral sex. She did become visibly upset uh, during that evidence. I must commend the court and the way they handled the um, complainant throughout because there were regular breaks and she was asked at various points if she wanted to take breaks. And more often than not, she declined them. But there were um, um, various breaks. Uh, particularly during the cross-examination, because that can be quite grueling. It only took an hour and a half for her to give her evidence in chief, but the cross-examination then was obviously um, much longer uh, than that. Uh, but she was an impressive witness. I mean, clearly it wasn't up for me to decide whether or not sure. she was telling 
that was up to the jury. And then the, four, the defendants did take to the stand. We weren't sure if they would or not, but they did. Uh, th- that's right, yes. They were under absolutely no obligation to do so, and speculation was rife uh, throughout the prosecution's case about whether or not they would. We would hear rumblings day in, day out about whether or not they were going to take the stand. And maybe that position changed throughout, and that's why we heard differing accounts, obviously, of whether or not they were going to take the stand. But they did, one and all, um, once the prosecution rested, they all took the stand. And um, one thing that the judge did say in relation to good character, and she did say that the men were of good character and evidence was called to support um, that claim, as she did say that when a person of good character takes the stand, it's usually um, credible. It goes towards their credibility, she said. Mm. Uh, Frank, in, in then our jurisdiction, uh, neither the complainant or the accused is named until the trial is over. That obviously was not the case um, up north over the last number of weeks. And uh, this thing became uh, a media hub. Uh, we covered it here quite clearly. It was uh, of interest to the public and in the public interest. So I appreciate it's a difficult question to answer, but the atmosphere in Belfast, has it been discernible in any way uh, whether the general public up in Belfast have been split, have taken one side or the other, or what's been your experience? Admittedly, a limited experience, but I'm sure you're seeing people even in the courtroom, in the galleries each day. Yeah, well, um, I think I underestimated how big a rugby town at Belfast is. Um, you can really feel Ulster rugby on, on the streets of Belfast. Buses pass by with the likes of Rory Best emblazoned across them. There are billboards a sports shop with Ulster rugby shirts in their front windows. Everybody talks about rugby. Everybody is passionate about rugby. This obviously coincided with the Six Nations campaign as well. So everybody was talking about Ireland, rug- Irish rugby, about how well uh, the team was doing in the Six Nations, and obviously the fact that they won the Grand Slam. There was great excitement about it. There was great ex- excitement about the Ulster players that took part in that uh, successful uh, campaign. I know it's a it's a hard measure to gauge, but certainly those 75 seats in the public gallery were mostly taken up by supporters for the four defendants. That's not to say that the complainant wasn't represented there, but it was just clear that there was um, far more support for the guys. Their families and friends were obviously there. I overheard two men who were in the case, um, in the trial throughout, and they were asked by um, another um, member of the public a gallery who they knew or who they were related to and they said they didn't know any of the guys that they were fans of Ulster Rugby and they were just there to le- uh, lend their support to the guys so there was a real sense um, of support for, for the boys um, it was palpable uh, you could see it in the public gallery at times uh, particularly during uh, closing speeches for example when emotions are high and the finish line is is nigh um, take for example Arthur Harvey who was representing uh, Blaine McElroy towards the end of his closing speech there was actually an impromptu round of applause from some people in the public gallery I was walking down these stairs afterwards and somebody approached me to say how impressive that was and when I said that each of the closing speeches were impressive in their own little way. This person challenged me again and said, yes, but surely Mr. Harvey's was the most impressive. And I simply told him that I wasn't allowed to have an opinion on, on individual uh, speeches. But that was kind of the support that okay. you felt um, in the courtroom throughout the nine-week trial was, was in general for the guys. OK, Frank, we'll leave it there. My thanks to you for the excellent reporting across the last eight weeks. Thank you. Frank Graney, News Talks Courts correspondent on the line there from uh, Belfast.